So um, robots, they've been around for 50 years by now, actually more than 50. And if you look at what robots have done over the past 50 years mainly, they have addressed the needs of the post-World War II, uh, uh, the needs of the society after the Second World War. And that means doing what? Producing better goods at a better price for a larger number of consumers around the world. And this means manufacturing robots, essentially. So these are the, the robots that have dominated the, the past uh, 50 years, if you like. And um, they still are the largest majority of robots which are deployed in the companies today. The largest number of units of robots sold every year. For example, in 2013, 200,000, uh, between 200,000 and 250,000 manufacturing robots have been sold around the world. And this corresponds to an increment of 27% over 2012. And if you look over 2011, there has also been a previous increment of approximately 25%. So manufacturing robots still represent the majority of robots deployed today in use and are bought by people. They are mainly used these days, 50% uh, are used and also produced, I should say, in Asia, and they go for the manufacturing of cars and for small electronics. But then, over the past 15 to 20 years, there has been a movement in the labs, in the research labs, which is about uh, a new type of robots. And these new types of robots are robots that touch upon the topics that Dario Gill recently just mentioned uh, earlier on. These are what we call uh, intelligent robots. Let's see. So here you have an example from Honda. What are intelligent robots? So these are robots that, can, that have artificial intelligence that allows them to cope with partially unknown and changing environments, which is a very big difference from the robots we've seen in manufacturing companies, which tend to work in very controlled environments and far away from people because they are dangerous. So the reason why we start now to have more intelligence robots, I mean as products, not just in the labs, are, are two. One is major developments in artificial intelligence, and Dario mentioned the major topics here. I would like to summarize uh, three of them, which I think are important. One is learning. You mentioned that. That's a great new development over the past 10, 15 years. The second one is uh, cognitive perception. Robots can see and make sense of, what, what, of their environment. And the third one that you also mentioned is human-robot interaction. So these three things are enabling these robots to become products that can be used by people, uh, not only in the lab. The second reason why these robots are making their way into the companies and into our daily life is that uh, the components, the critical components that make these robots, sensors and computers, are now available at the lower price and this is driven by the smartphone industry. When I, I've been developing robots for the past 20 years, but only approximately 15, 10 years ago, we started to have cameras and processors that are available at a very low price that allow us to build these robots reliably and at the cost that people can buy, companies and also individual people. So these are drivers of, uh, of this new wave of uh, intelligent robots, which you are going to see in a moment. Now, these new intelligent robots are different from the manufacturing robots. We call them service robots because they provide a service for people and for companies. And I want to show to you now the next new wave of robots, which are coming not uh, in 15 years' time, but in the next five years. And some of these are already being developed. They're going to dramatically change the way in which we interact with these machines. I will show to you four examples, four directions, which affect different types of industry, uh, which you will see uh, increasingly more around yourself. So the first one is the combination of uh, manufacturing. Where should I point this? Uh. Okay, the first one is the combination of manufacturing and intelligent robots. We have a new trend, it's called co-workers. These are robots here, you see a picture from uh, ABB. These are robots which work alongside workers. They will do the same thing as the manufacturing robots have done in the past. They help the worker to produce goods at a faster rate, more precisely, and at a lower cost. But it will not replace humans, they will work with humans. So you have a human doing some work and then passing the job on to the robot, which will use, for example, hands and vision to do some very complicated assembly before passing it on to another human. This is one thing. You also have uh, robots which are going to work with humans, but perhaps also replace humans in some tasks. You already have a company in the US, for example, it's called Rethink Robotics, which sells a, one of these uh, um, uh, worker companions, let's say, for 20,000 US dollars. This price bracket 
allows small companies with less than 20 employees to buy manufacturing robots and put one of these robots on the manufacturing floor alongside with the worker. These robots are not as fast as the conventional manufacturing robots. They are slower, but they are flexible because they can learn, as Dario said, by demonstration. You don't have to program them. You show to them how to do things, you move their arms, and they learn. So it's very easy to buy them and adopt them and put them at work immediately, also for small companies which do not have a, an already uh, complicated branch. Uh, the second trend which we are going to see, always on the factory floor, is uh, what we call wearable robots. So wearable robots are robots that you wear on your body. They can be prosthetic devices like arms and legs, but these address a very niche market. Where we're going to see a big difference is when we have this wearable technology with new types of motors, intelligence, and interpretation of the human body and needs being used by workers on the factory floor. We start to have companies doing this. This is, for example, a Swiss uh, spin-off uh, company. Uh, who's deploying at the moment robots at, uh, at factory floors at uh, Audi, the car manufacturer. These robots allow workers to work for longer time, being more productive, and reducing the number of injuries. As these robots will become more connected with the body signals and with the nervous systems, the productivity will be enormously increased, and we're going to use them also for recreational use, like learning a new sport, augmenting our capabilities. So I was at the um, uh, largest uh, fair in robotics in Japan last year, and I saw 20 companies for the very first time in the exhibition floor showing wearable robots, something I'd never seen before. The third trend everybody knows about, but I just want to mention it, is robotic cars. Robotic cars are wearable robots. You sit ah. in these cars, they learn about you, and they drive for you. Now, they are not going perhaps to be completely autonomous, I've been working, for example, with Toyota and, uh, and with Honda. They perhaps don't believe that these, the drivers will want to give uh, control entirely to, to the brain of the car, but there will be shared control, meaning that the, the car will understand when the person wants to be in charge and knows when has to take over. And this shared control, which is, by the way, another field of artificial intelligence rapidly developing, is going to be crucial for the deployment of this type of technology so that humans feel always in control when they want to be in control. And the last trend I want to mention is drones. And you've heard about drones too. Now, drones are the fastest growing sector in the field of mobile robots or service robots or intelligent robots in terms of units sold around the world. They are used for all sorts of things. They're used for mapping. They are used by architects to provide news, uh, new views of building. They are used by filmmakers. They are used by mining companies to extract volumetric data about the material being extracted. They are used for improving agriculture and farming, what's called digital farming. They're using for surveying disaster areas, camping, refugee camps, all sorts of things. Now, they will be used for transportation in the future, although they will have to be larger but it will be used for transportation too. Now, the, there are no technological roadblocks to make these drones more capable and more pervasive. The major roadblock here is legislation and privacy issues. It's something that I touched on a recent article in Nature, we published a, two weeks ago, a special insight section on machine intelligence and what it will take uh, uh, for the next few years uh, for us to have these robots and this intelligence to deploy it. And there I elaborate a little bit more in detail to what we have to do for enabling this, this technology to move in the real world. Now, all this seems very good, and it seems like these intelligent robots are going to be uh, around us very soon and conquer the world. But the facts are the following. If you look in terms of numbers, um, the number of manufacturing robots sold and deployed in the world every year is still three times larger than the number of intelligent or service robots which I mentioned before. What you see here on this graph is a projection by International Federation of Robotics, the recent data, the most recent data, is a project projection of the number of units of intelligent robots being deployed over the next three years. You see them, they are divided in different categories. But the most important figure here is that in three years, for the next three years, they predict approximately 150,000 robots being deployed of this new type. That means 50,000 robots per year, whereas we have 250,000 manufacturing robots per year. So 
Here you see the different divisions. Defense is the largest field. Uh, if you look, then you have field robotics. These are inspection robots. Mobile platforms, it's a different categorization from field robots. You have logistic, transportation, medical robots. If you look at the same uh, uh, image in terms of sales, amount of the cost is slightly different because the medical robots, very few units, but they cost a lot, 250,000 to 1 million. But what I want to say is why don't we, gonna, why we are not seeing more larger numbers? And there are a few roadblocks ahead. The first one is, as I mentioned in some fields, is legislation. So the governments, if they want to improve productivity, they have to change the legislation, the privacy and the concerns to allow these robots to go around, to be deployed, so that businesses can set up companies and sell these robots. Today, it's a little bit of a risky business, so to speak. The second roadblock is the return on investment. These machines are complicated. And so before you absorb the cost of buying one of these machines, it takes some time. So it's not just like software. The third thing is related is the scalability of the business. If you want to deploy software, if you have a good piece of software, you can clone it and distribute very vastly. If you want to have a piece of hardware with motors and uh, all sorts of sensors, you cannot scale it so rapidly. And so it's going to take a longer time before this uh, will uh, spread. And the final thing is uh, psychological acceptance. Of course, the public needs to be educated, companies need to be educated before this takes place. What about the impact in the, on the workforce? I believe that this new class of intelligent robots are not going to replace humans. They're going to enhance productivity and work with humans. However, the manufacturing robots, which are still the dominant, dominant part of robots in the world, will continue to replace the workforce for the foreseeable future. Thank you. <laughs>